can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ethics in Public, Considering Community and Moral Evaluation with Dr. David Jones, and we're excited to get started and have you here. I want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, BNH Publishing, who has donated a Word Search Bible package for each participant in the Southeastern Symposium. My name is Aaron Duxworth, and I'm a Master of Theology student, as well as on staff here at Southeastern. The purpose of the seminary's Master of Theology degree program is to provide the post-MDiv student with an opportunity for advanced guided research under the supervision of a faculty member in a special area of theological study. Some students choose this program to enhance their academic qualifications for postgraduate or doctoral studies. Other students choose this program primarily to extend their preparation for ministry in a local church, on the mission field, or in other positions of denominational service. The THM is designed to build leaders through personal mentoring by the faculty and by advanced study. THM students also have the opportunity to earn up to 12 hours of PhD credit. For more information about the THM program, I will leave a link down in the chat box, so feel free to check out the link and visit our website. If this is your first time with us, please be aware of both the chat box and the Q&A box. The chat box is where panelists will send information out to the entire group, and there's going to be a link for the THM program, as well as there's a link now for the paper that Dr. Jones will be presenting. The Q&A box is where you'll be asked to you'll be able to ask questions of the speaker. And here's how the Q&A will work. You may type questions into the Q&A or give reactions at any point during the presentation. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise your hand button. If your question is selected, you will receive uh, the type response, raise your hand in the Q&A box. Please do not raise your hand unless you have been instructed to do so. When it's time for you to ask your questions, uh, I'll call on you and I'll unmute you and send you a request. Uh, you have to give us access to unmute you as well. Um, and at that point, ask your question. Once you've finished, uh, we'll mute your microphone again and Dr. Jones will answer any questions that you may have. Now, I would like to present Dr. David Jones, Professor of Christian Ethics, Associate Dean for Theological Studies and the Director of the THM Program. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Aaron. I uh, want to just say again, uh, that, uh, I encourage you to download a copy of, um, of the paper uh, over in the chat box. Uh, the paper is actually a little bit too long, and so I'm going to actually probably skip over uh, some towards the end. But if you have the paper, you'll be able to get the, uh, the entire thing. All right. So here it goes. Ethics in public. Carl F.H. Henry, arguably the father of evangelical ethics, titled his mid-20th century ethics volume, Christian Personal Ethics. Indeed, Henry, uh, indeed, the title Henry chose is quite appropriate for an introductory ethics text, as biblically speaking, moral reasoning is both Christian and personal, at least within the evangelical tradition. It's interesting to observe that in his book, Henry focuses almost entirely upon the moral formation of individuals, scarcely mentioning the context in which his readers would live out their ethics, that is, the community. In all fairness to Henry, seven years after publishing Christian Personal Ethics, he did write a companion volume that explored the place of community in moral reasoning. However, a perusal of modern day introductory Christian ethics texts reveals that few evangelical ethicists have given much space to the concept of community and moral evaluation. The purpose of this paper is to consider the place and importance of community when assessing moral events. In this study, two specific aspects of Christian ethics and community will be investigated. First, this work will look at the concept that can best be described with the phrase second order moral accountability. In short, second order moral accountability is the idea that an individual may be reckoned guilty of the sins of another or make another guilty of one's own sins simply by being present within a community. Second, this paper will investigate the exercise of Christian liberty in the public square with a focus upon so-called adiaphora ethical issues. Moral topics classified as adiaphora in nature are those that are viewed as being morally indifferent within a given community. By examining Christian liberty and adiaphora ethical issues, this paper will highlight the importance of considering the conscience of others who witness or who are likely to witness 
one's engagement in morally indifferent practices within the public square. And considering the place of community in moral evaluation, with a focus upon the two areas identified above, the goal of this paper is not to minimize individual moral accountability, nor to suggest a community-based hermeneutic, nor to argue for some form of societal utilitarianism. In fact, this work will assume the validity of an evangelical, deontological, divine command theory of Christian ethics. Yet an, an historic liability of moral reasoning that focuses solely upon individuals is that the context of moral events can become minimized or even neglected. In other words, within a system of personal ethics, it's possible to so emphasize individuals that the communities in which moral agents reside are either overlooked or viewed as not being relevant to moral evaluation. The aim of this paper then, in considering the place of community when assigning moral praise or blame, is to offer a corrective to ethical approaches that have perhaps not weighed the importance of community in the process of moral evaluation. Part one, second order moral accountability. As was noted above, the phrase second order moral accountability is the idea that an individual may be reckoned guilty of the sins of another or make another guilty of one's own sins simply by being present within a given community. While it's difficult to find formal support for second order moral accountability in academic literature, the concept is often present as an assumption in popular moral reasoning. Take, for instance, the notion that Christians ought to boycott a certain retail establishment because the store sells pornographic magazines. Such boycotts are often justified with the claim that to patronize the retailer makes one guilty of the sin of pornography by way of affiliation. A second example comes from, from the, the, the political realm, where some believe that to vote for a candidate whose personal moral failures are well known or who endorses sinful public policies renders an individual voter culpable of the candidate's known immorality. In the above examples, second order moral accountability seems like a useful concept, and it may even be so, for it could help mobilize Christians to curb the spread of pornography in the public square, as well as to assist in keeping immoral candidates from public office. Indeed, these are worthwhile goals. Yet while the moral objectives in view are praiseworthy, it's the contention of this work that the idea being employed in the process of moral evaluation, that is second order moral accountability, is not legitimate. And as will be demonstrated below, is ultimately an impractical concept. Note, however, that the problem uh, with the above and similar examples is not the moral event itself, but the mechanism being employed in order to justify the ethic. We'll investigate this idea below by surveying an Old Testament passage, looking at a New Testament text, consulting an example from Jesus' ministry, as well as considering the practicality of second order moral accountability. After this, we'll review three caveats related to second order moral accountability before moving on to consider the ethics of Christian liberty in the public square. First, an Old Testament example, Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. At first glance, holding the concept of second order moral accountability up to the light of scripture may seem to yield support for the idea. One Old Testament passage that appears to affir affirm the notion is the second commandment of the Decalogue. To elaborate, after stating the second commandment, which prohibits the manufacture and worship of idols, God declared to his people, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. A cursory reading of this passage could, could lead one to the conclusion that within a given community, in this case a family, God imputes the moral guilt of one member to others in the clan, visiting the iniquity of a particular family member upon those who are not present, or perhaps even upon those who are not yet born. Further investigation, however, into Old Testament biblical teachings about the dynamics of sin and guilt reveals that this interpretation of the second commandment cannot possibly be correct, for other passages clearly contradict such an understanding. For example, Deuteronomy 24, 16 reads, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Similarly, the prophet Ezekiel wrote, 
the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the, bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself, Ezekiel 18.20. In light of these citations, as well as other similar passages, it seems clear that the Old Testament does not endorse second-order moral accountability, at least not in the sense in which it's commonly understood. This, however, invites the question, how then are we to understand the, the generational warning appended to the second commandment? Bricker explains, the text does not say that God holds one's descendant, a son or a grandson, personally responsible for his father's sins. Nor does this text say that the generational extension of punishment has anything to do with, with the legal administration of justice. But the text does hold out the threat that one's descendants may suffer for their parents' sin. In other words, in the second commandment, God reminds his people of the fact that sin is never just personal. That is, it always affects others, especially those to whom one is closest. In some, then, while the second commandment does not teach second order moral accountability, as we assess moral events in the public square, we must keep in mind the multi-generational effects of individual sins upon the community. A New Testament example. 2 John verses 10 and 11. A New Testament scriptural text we'll consider that relates to the idea of second order moral accountability is 2 John 10 and 11. The short book of 2 John was written by the, by the Apostle John in order to warn a particular church about false teachers who were traveling in their area. Specifically, John wrote to exhort believers in this church to not show hospitality to the itinerant heretics should they appear in their community. Note that in the early church era, where safe lodging was not readily available, nomadic teachers and missionaries often relied upon the kindness and generosity of others in order to facilitate their ministries. Given these dynamics and the presence of false teachers in their region, John instructed the church, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Taken at face value, this passage may seem to affirm the idea of second-order moral accountability, for John refers to Christians who share in the deeds of false teachers by receiving them into their homes. Upon closer inspection, however, it becomes clear that John does not, te does not teach showing hospitality to heretics makes one guilty of the sin of advocating false doctrine. Indeed, the term quinaneo that John employs in 2 John 11 uh, which is rendered shares in many English translation, means just that, to support, to commune, or to enable. Thus, in this passage, John's exhortation to the church is to not naively lodge itinerant false teachers, for doing so would enable the heretic's harmful ministry. The unintended sin committed by those showing hospitality, then, is not false teaching. Rather, by supporting the traveling deceivers, naive Christian hosts, would fail to discern truth and to love their neighbors well. In warning the church about this possible sin, John was simply endorsing Paul's earlier teaching that God will render to each one according to his own deeds, Romans 2 and verse 6. An example from Christ's ministry, Matthew 22, 15 through 22. A third biblical text relevant to the topic of second order moral accountability is Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. In this well-known narrative from Christ's ministry, the Pharisees and Herodians were attempting to test Jesus as they tried to provoke his downfall. In this passage, these leaders attempted to catch Jesus in the verbal trap as they asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? The tax in view here was likely the poll tax, which was universally despised by the Jews, for it was used to finance the occupying Roman army. With their question then, these scheming leaders sought to entangle Christ as follows. If Jesus spoke against the payment of taxes, the Herodians would have charged him with rebellion against Rome. If, however, Christ advocated for the payment of taxes, then the Pharisees would have accused him of disloyalty to the Jewish nation. Given the sensitivity of this question, Jesus' response is quite instructive. Perhaps in contrast to the expectation of the Herodians, in his response, Christ clearly supported the payment of taxes, but not before reminding his listeners 
that the coin he'd been handed was engraved with Caesar's image. Therefore, since the coin was produced by Rome, it logically belonged to Rome. Of interest to this study is the fact that Jesus did not understand the payment of tax, of tax monies, some of which would surely be used to finance immoral activities, as being an act that rendered one guilty of the many egregious sins of Rome. Indeed, as was the case with the other biblical passages surveyed above, in this example from Christ's ministry, we can see that second-order moral accountability is not endorsed. Jesus' response, though, ought not to have surprised his hearers, for Matthew records an occasion from earlier in Christ's public ministry where Jesus had explicitly taught about moral accountability. On this occasion, Christ noted that in the end times, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will render to each one according to his own works. Matthew 16 and verse 27. Some practical considerations. Another aspect of second order moral accountability to consider is the viability of the practice. In reviewing this idea, it becomes evident that second order moral accountability would be very difficult to implement, at least in a consistent manner. To elaborate by way of illustration, when writing about boycotts, Frame notes that if second order moral accountability were a valid principle, we would have to boycott any corporation that contributed in any way to immorality in society. On that basis, we would have to boycott nearly every business, withdrawing almost entirely from the world of commerce. Scripture never takes that approach. In fact, contrary to the notion of withdrawing from society, Paul instructed the Corinthian church that they were to associate with sinners in the public square. As he noted, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters. Then you would have to need, then you would need to go out of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. Clearly, Paul was not an advocate of second order moral accountability. Now, some caveats, uh, three caveats that relate to the above teaching. From the biblical passages considered above, it seems clear that second-order moral accountability is not taught in Scripture, at least not in an isolated practice. Furthermore, even if it were a valid concept, second-order moral accountability would nearly be impossible to implement with consistency. These facts notwithstanding, three caveats are in order. First, we must not confuse second-order moral accountability with the error of influencing, manipulating, or persuading another person to commit a sin. In other words, just because each one will be held accountable for his own sin does not mean that it's permissible to influence another person to commit a sin intentionally or otherwise. In such cases, the one who inspires transgression may not be guilty of the sin of the one who has been influenced. Yet the enabler is guilty of his own sin, which at a minimum would include a lack of neighbor love. Observe that Jesus identified love of neighbor as the second greatest commandment. Therefore, the one who fails to properly love his neighbor is guilty of great sin. Another caveat related to second order moral accountability is the concept of the corporate nature of sin. In short, awareness of the corporate nature of sin is the realization that we live in a fallen world. We're surrounded by those who are predisposed towards sin, and we ourselves are great sinners. Therefore, even though second-order moral accountability is not a valid concept in regard to guilt, we must acknowledge that our entire context is biased towards sin. Said differently, because the world is sloped towards sin, the community oftentimes carries us in that direction. The danger in failing to acknowledge this is that it may lead one to view sin as normative. Yet a recognition of the corporate nature of sin will position us to better see our own sin, the sins of others, as well as the impact of sin upon the world, including its cultures and structures. Such an awareness will enable us to effectively confront sin, wherever it may be found. By way of example, note that when the prophet Isaiah appeared before God, prior to presenting his prayer request, he acknowledged, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, verse 5. A third caveat related to the concept of, original, of, of second-order moral accountability 
is the doctrine of original sin, which is sometimes referred to as inherited sin. The passage most often cited in support of this doctrine is Romans 5, verses 12 through 19. In this passage, Paul teaches, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned, Romans 5, 12. In reference to this verse, Grudem explains original sin as follows. When Adam sinned, God thought of all who would descend from Adam as sinners. Though we did not yet exist, God, looking into the future, began thinking of us as those who were guilty like Adam. At first glance, the idea of original sin seems to support the concept of second order moral accountability. Note, however, this doctrine does not teach that all men are guilty of Adam's sin. Rather, this doctrine holds that all men sinned in Adam, whether it be with Adam as our federal head or through Adam as our progenitor. Therefore, original sin teaches that man is held guilty for his own sin in Adam. Grudem explains, original sin is original in that it comes from Adam, and it is also original in that we have it from the beginning of our existence as persons, but it is still our sin, not Adam's sin, that is meant. Part two, Christian liberty in the public square. A second important topic that relates to the ethics, uh, to ethics in the public square is the exercise of Christian liberty. Christian liberty is the idea that there is a degree of freedom in the application, but not the content of God's moral law as it is applied in one's life. This teaching relates to practices that are not explicitly prohibited or specifically allowed in the Bible. Thus, Christian liberty may include activities in which believers are free to engage, or it may entail practices from which believers are free to abstain. Examples of area where this teaching has been invoked in the past include consuming alcohol, worship practices, music styles, games of chance, military service, uh, places of employment, matters of commerce, eating practices, the observance of special days, and the like. In each of these areas, Christians have historically agreed that there is a degree of freedom in how the unchanging moral law of God is applied. As we'll explore in the discussion that follows, the exercise of Christian liberty in the public square is not subjective. Rather, it's governed by several important objective factors. Oftentimes, theologians will refer uh, to practices that fall under the umbrella of Christian liberty as adiaphora issues. The term adiaphora literally means things indifferent. Thus, activities related to Christian liberty are commonly understood to be morally indifferent in nature. Out of convention, we'll use the phrase adiaphora issues in the discussion that follows. However, we should take note that this term is actually a misnomer, for in reality, there are no morally indifferent practices. As I've argued elsewhere, every volitional ethical event is either moral or immoral. This is why Paul instructs the believers in Colossae, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3, verse 17. In the discussion that follows, we'll consider the place of weaker and stronger brethren in the community, we'll review the importance of conscience in moral decision-making, and we'll conclude by suggesting several principles that will aid in the practice of Christian liberty in the public square. First, weaker and stronger brethren. Oftentimes, assigning moral praise or blame is as simple as evaluating an ethical event in light of God's revelation in Scripture. In regard to adiaphora issues, however, another factor that must be considered is the presence or absence of weaker or stronger brethren in the context of the moral event. In fact, in the two most lengthy and significant passages in the Bible on the doctrine of Christian liberty, that is Romans 14, 1 through 15, 13, and 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 10, 33, Paul repeatedly exhorts believers to be mindful of the presence of weaker brethren in the community. When engaging in morally indifferent activities, such as such a purposeful awareness and, vigil, uh, and vigilance is a mark of neighbor love. Since few people would self-identify as weaker brethren, Paul defines his categories as he discusses weaker and stronger brethren. In mentioning weaker brethren, Paul characterizes such individuals as being weak in faith, lacking full biblical knowledge, and having a fragile conscience. 
However, from Paul's discussion, it's clear that a weaker brother is not any immature believer, a so-called carnal Christian, or even a believer who happens to disagree with an aspect of one's theology or ethics. Rather, in Paul's discussion, a weaker brother is identified as someone who will be caused to violate their own conscience in regard to an idea for an issue because of the influence and example of another Christian in the community. For the weaker brother, the sin committed is not engaging in or, or, or abstaining from a particular act. Rather, it's the defilement of their own conscience. In Paul's epistles, stronger brothers are described as individuals who have a mature faith, possess an abundance of scriptural knowledge, and have a biblically informed conscience. While we may be tempted to view a believer who is a meticulous lawkeeper as a stronger brother, ironically, such individuals are actually described as weaker brethren in Scripture. Perhaps counterintuitively, the Bible identifies the stronger brother as he who is without extra biblical moral scruples. Indeed, stronger brethren exhibit a gracious freedom in Christ, for they understand that God's moral law is, as James wrote, the law of liberty, James 1.25 and 2.12, and that as Jesus taught, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, John 8, 36. Note, however, that in Scripture, the stronger brother is always called to accommodate his actions, that is, to sacrifice his Christian liberty for the sake of the weaker brother. This is because the stronger brother can do so without sinning, while the weaker brother can only accommodate his actions by violating his, his conscience and thereby sinning. Christian liberty and the conscience. Another factor to consider as we exercise Christian liberty in the public square is the conscience. Indeed, the conscience is a frequently cited concept in the Bible, and it's an important component in the process of moral decision making. Scripture describes the conscience in various ways. Positively, the Bible speaks of having a good conscience, a clear conscience, a cleansed conscience, and a conscience without guilt. Negatively, Scripture mentions the possibility of an evil conscience, a defiled conscience, a weak conscience, as well as a seared conscience. Whether it's functioning positively or negatively, the conscience can be defined as the component of the human constitution that bears witness to the morality of actions. The conscience communicates an inherent moral oughtness that stems from man being made in the image of God. In a perfect, unfallen world, the conscience would accurately and comprehensively reflect God's moral will. However, in the, her, her, however, since the fall of man, the conscience has been susceptible to being co-opted by sin. This is because the conscience is informed by the, the mind or the intellect, and the brain is part of the fallen fleshly body. While believers receive a new nature, a new immaterial nature, uh, at the moment of conversion, they must wait for a new material body until their resurrection at the return of Christ. Consequently, Prior to their, their glorification, Christians must wrestle with, with, sinful, with the sinful flesh, which includes the mind. Additionally, the conscience is continually being conditioned by one's own experiences, which are oftentimes sinful in the context of the fallen world. The fact that the conscience can be misled by the fallen mind and misaligned on account of sinful experiences means that it's possible for one's conscience to be wrong. In Pauline terminology, an individual whose conscience has been misinformed or is as yet uninformed in regard to an idea for, an idea for issue, issue is a weaker brother. Concerning morally different practices, when a stronger brother causes a weaker brother to violate his own conscience, even though the weaker brother's conscience may be incorrect, it is a sinful act. In such cases, the stronger brother, in effect, encourages the weaker brother to disregard his conscience. This is wrong, for in regard to non-morally different practices, the weaker brother uh, needs to follow his conscience. The possibility of this phenomenon highlights the need for all believers to be aware of the presence of weaker brethren in the community. Moreover, Christians must be continually filling, training, and programming, or perhaps reprogramming their minds with the truth of the Word of God. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some principles of Christian liberty that I, I give in the next uh, page and a half and skip to the conclusion. This paper has sought to investigate the place and importance of community when assessing moral events. In considering the concept of second order moral accountability, 
The argument presented in this work was largely deconstructive in nature, as the survey of selected biblical passages demonstrated the fallacy of second order moral accountability. In contrast, um, the review of Christian liberty in the second half of this work was constructive in nature, as this paper sought to highlight the difference between weaker and stronger brethren, to draw attention to the idea of conscience, and to give Christians several objective principles to follow in their exercise of Christian liberty in the public square. And with that, I conclude.